From the clothes we wear to the cars we drive. From what we use to look good to what we use to relax. Our lives are full of products and our products are full of animals. In the past few years, I've learned quite a lot about how the meat we eat reaches our plates. But I've always wondered what happens to the bits of the animal that we don't eat. And it turns out that these oh. leftover parts are made into things we use every day. That's a, that's a symbolic noise for, like, leather. As well as some things we couldn't even imagine. To find out how, I'm going on an extraordinary journey to see these raw animal parts transformed into shiny new products. And I'm going to be joined by the people who use them to see what they make of it. And of course, the sheep need to get slaughtered. Are we actually going to be in the room? Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Mine had a testicle on it! <laughs> oh, don't film me being sick. We'll be going behind the doors of unknown companies and into hidden worlds. That is just such a weird vision. Just skin hanging there. This is when we start to see what's inside the chest. <laughs> Getting hands on. I don't think that's going to go in there, Julie. And discovering what makes these animal leftovers <laughs> so indispensable. <laughs> what am I doing here with these? Could knowing that so many of our favourite items contain animals change the way we feel about them forever? <laughs> we are a nation of meat lovers. Every year in the UK, we munch our way through tens of millions of cows, sheep and pigs and half a million tonnes of fish and seafood. But our use for animals doesn't stop at the dinner table. Over the course of this series, I've been amazed to discover the many ways that the bits of animal we don't eat can be turned into products we can't do without. I mean, that's just strange, isn't it? In this programme, I'll be revisiting some of the most shocking and surprising uses I've found. <gasps> oh, my God! It's a fish! It turns out that hidden animals lurk everywhere. <laughs> From our bathroom cabinets and bedside tables to our laundrettes and pubs. But despite the fact that we come skin to skin with these products almost every day, most of us have little idea about where they're from or what's in them. Including this group of lads from Manchester who I took to a local slaughterhouse to find out how a cow becomes a leather car seat. Here we are. Friends Calvin, Curtis, and Jordan like to look good when they're out on the town. For them, a high-end motor with a quality interior is an essential part of the image. I want a leather interior, but it's got to be tan. Like, it can't be, it can't be cream, it can't be black. You know the one It's like, it's not red and it's not cream. Mm. It's like in between. Yeah. And it's just that noise, it's like, that's a, <laughs> that's a symbolic noise for, like, leather. leather. But had they ever considered where their sumptuous interior started its life? No one thinks about that kind of thing. All they want is to see that leather in the car because it's a statement, literally. And it is quite comfy, actually. See, no one thinks where anything comes from at all. It's like you've not got time Because to it's think. on a shelf, so as far as you're concerned, if you buy something from Tesco, it's from Tesco. From te yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Or mm. it was made at Tesco. Mm. And how did they feel about what was to come? Anyone themselves who sees something die or kill, you're going to have some type of emotional reaction. You know, I don't believe anyone can stand there and blatantly say, I'm not bothered by that. With that in mind, I took the boys to meet John Metric at his family-run slaughtering and butchery business in the Peak District. Hi, hey, Julie. The Metrics operate what's known as a best practice abattoir, which means animal welfare is a top priority. Welcome to our small abattoir here in the Derbyshire Hills. This is Carlos here, the vet. He's just looking at the animals at the moment just to make sure that they're fit and healthy for slaughter. I don't want to get too close because these animals are in an unfamiliar environment. We don't want to bolt them by a lot of strange faces looking in because it's very important to keep the animals calm. What do you think, looking at the, looking at the animals now, lads? Um, they don't look too happy. They look like they know what's to do. <laughs> you think so? Do you think of your car seat covers when you look at these animals? When you see a cow, you don't, you don't, you don't think of the process. You don't think of a potential car seat? You no, you think, it. oh, that could be a couch at the FS or <laughs> it could be in a BMW. You just think yeah. it's a cow. 
What's next, John? We need to go and get kitted up to see the next part of the process. So if you'd like to follow me. Okay. Bring, yeah. Yes. We made are. our way to the lairage where the cows are stunned. Okay. Now this here is the captive bolt gun, which is used for stunning cattle. It doesn't shoot a bullet. It actually shoots a piece of metal out, a bolt, into the animal's head, and the bolt penetrates the skull and renders the animal brain dead. All its sensations are gone, everything's gone. It's effectively out. Do you think you could do it? Shoot the cow in the head? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but I'd get it better emotionally after you've done it. We followed John to the slaughter hall, where the life of each cow is ended. Being on this side of realisation, knowing that a cow in about two minutes or so is just going to drop through there right at my feet, brain dead is a bit, like, worrying. My heart is going to mm. sink. <laughs> oh, I just don't like it. So what he's doing now, he's going to lift the animal up at an angle and he'll push it along this gantry here, right, over the top of the bleed area. He's had those knives in a steriliser. He's got two knives there. One of them is actually through cutting through the fur, which he's done now, and then he gets the second knife and he cuts the main blood vessels, right? So he's gone through the carotid artery there. All the blood vessels, you know, yeah. leading to the head are now severed. <laughs> so that's the jugular oh. vein and the carotid artery mm. cut. So all that kicking is those it's weird. muscles shutting down the chemical reactions. It never gets any easier to watch, I can tell you that. Because I can see the red meat inside, I'm already starting to think of it as food. As, as, yeah. As food. Yeah. But it's not the meat that will end up on their car seats. It's the hide that we had come to see, and removing it is an incredibly skilled job. He's got a seam there just between the actual hide and the fat. It's very important that when he does that, he hits that seam, because if he actually cuts through the fat, then what he'll do is disturb blood vessels that will actually burst and he won't be able to see where he's going. And you notice he's making long strokes with his knife as well, and that's quite deliberate because he's not wanting to score the inside of the hide. And that scoring, you know, which is the roughness, will mean that the hide will be worth less money, so it's long, smooth cuts you can see he's making, yeah? Looking a bit peaky there. You all right? Yeah, I'm all right, just... I'm just not gonna like try and pretend that this is all right. Do you know what I mean? Like you're so far removed from this process because it comes to us nice in a little packet and it tastes nice and, and the leather it feels nice. You don't think of it like this. So once the hide is completely removed, it's taken through to the offal house. This is a shoot in which the hide comes through. Uh, so that's uh, off one of the Belgian blue heifers uh, that we saw earlier in the lairage. This is the back end here, you can see the tail there, and that's the neck end there. Now, when the recession hit, the price of that hide dropped to as little as nine pounds. For all of that? For all of that. Wow. And that's when the car industry was in trouble. They weren't needing the leather interiors. We were only getting nine quid for it. It had been a challenging and thought-provoking morning. During the process of programmes that I've made, I think I've probably witnessed that with different animals about 60 times. And I don't think I want to see it again. Yeah. <laughs> but every time I think about it and go round and round, I can't think of a better way. I mean, if this is what you're going to do, if you're going to eat meat, if you're going to use meat and animal products. Yeah, if it has to be done that way, then that is probably the, the perfect way of doing it. <laughs> To find out how this mass of soggy skins turns into a classy car interior, we headed north to Glasgow, home of the Scottish Leather Group, the UK's largest producers of cow leather, where Gareth Scott showed us around. Hi there, you all right? This is a delivery which came in this morning out of an abattoir in the south of England. It's heavy, is it? What? That's how, so heavy. How heavy is that? <laughs> After inspection, the hide goes through a process called liming, which removes all the hair from the skin. 24 hours later, the hides emerge hair-free. That is just such a weird vision. Skin hanging there, moving around slowly. Next, the fat and tissue is removed from the skin. 
feels so rubbery. It's really rubbery, isn't it? And the remaining hide is mechanically split in two. It's the grain half of the hide that's used to make high-quality leather, but first it must be tanned with chemicals to preserve it. It's just a big drum of chamois leathers now, isn't it? Yeah. Each stage just takes it further and further away from being a cow. See, now it's not a cow. The leather is pressed, dried and put through a final shaving machine to make it thinner still. This is it, this is the finished product. And this will basically go in the in Aston Martin car seat. Now that it's like this, I just think, screw the cow. Just think, look how nice it is. Yeah, but still, you know where it came from, you were there. You've yeah, but it don't matter that... now, we've got what we want. Really? You have to remember, the cow will never be killed for this yeah. piece of leather. Yeah. That's what's it's good about it, that a cow leather. is killed for me. This is a byproduct that's just happened to be so profitable. We've been through like tragedy, death, blood, go. Oh, this is nice. Do you know what I mean? To make its way onto desirable car doors, seats, and dashboards, the finished leather is pattern cut and hand stitched before being fitted into every freshly minted vehicle. And it's here that the cow arrives at its final destination. Worldwide, 320 million cattle hides were turned into leather last year, and over 50 million of these ended up in vehicles. But it's not just cars that look good in leather. Leather and suede are staples of the fashion industry, from jackets and shoes to handbags and belts. When it comes to looking glam, Leather is big business, and it doesn't just come from cows, which seem to surprise the Great British public. What do you think that is? Um, suede? suede. Suede from which animal? It's fabricated, right? Uh, cow. Cow? I don't know. Cow? Cow? <laughs> or could it be from a pig? No way. It's pig suede. Is it? Yeah. Really? No, I don't want to wear be wearing a pig on my feet. A pig on your feet. I've bought how many pigs? <laughs> in the UK, we like to leave the skin on our pigs to eat, but a trip to Poland revealed how elsewhere in the world pigs are skinned at slaughter. See it as a bag now, mm. don't you? And then the skin is turned to leather and suede. It's more common than you might think. About 10% of the world's leather is made from pig skin. And it's mostly found in our clothes and shoes. Feel wow. the soft, soft suede. Oh, so that's pig suede. Our wardrobes are a virtual farmyard of animals. <laughs> Sheepskin boots, guess what they're made of? In the UK, we purchase a million pairs every year. And fish skin? Yep, even fish skin is used to make leather. So it's placing the tail down and release fish. Salmon bag. Here is salmon. Look at that. that is amazing. What do we think of this handbag here? It's cute. I like it. Oh my gosh! It's a fish. fish. Wow. No way. Oh, right. A fish. <laughs> High fashion is all about looking good, but looking good isn't all about clothes. Cosmetics, creams, hairsprays, soaps. The UK beauty industry is worth about £8 billion a year, and it's absolutely brimming with animal byproducts. I took best friends Rachel and Emily to Iceland to discover just what went into some of their favourite products. Well, every other day I wash my hair, so I'm putting shampoo and conditioner in it. Then a volumizing mousse. Then I have a hair serum for the ends of my hair. I will probably put a heat defensing spray to protect it from the blow drying. A curl boosting mousse. Cover it with hairspray. And I'll reapply hairspray several times during the day. I thought I was high maintenance. Feels really nice. But how much do they know about what's in their products? I do think about what goes into um, the products, but a lot of the time I don't understand what's written on the back of packets. I've been vegetarian for about 20 years. If I found out that my favourite hair product was animal tested or contained any raw animal product, I would be 
so upset. Iceland seemed a bizarre place for any hair product to start its life, but fishing marketeer Bjorn was on hand to help. Hi, say hello to Bjorn. Hello. Hi, Hi. Nice welcome. Hi, nice, nice to meet you. you. And we have to say welcome to Iceland, don't we? Thank yes. you. Because this yes. is the first time. Yes, it, it is, is, absolutely. Have you heard of a product called Kytazan? No. No, we haven't. Kytazan is found in hair products. Right. Never heard of it. What is it, Bjorn? Well, I will not tell you now. First, we will go to the spot, out to the sea, and then afterwards, you will find out what it is. Ah. Exciting! Okay, oh, that's what we're on the boat. Let's go get an adventure. Go. Come on, girls. As we tried to find our sea legs, Bjorn explained that the trawler we were on could hold 20 tonnes of fish. It goes out in rough seas for five and six days at a time, fishing deep in the Arctic Circle. Oh, <laughs> don't feel me being sick. We were keen to fish out the origin of Kytazan, but Bjorn was playing slightly hard to get. What are we fishing for today? Today, we are fishing prawns. Prawns? Because you were asking about Kytazan, uh -huh. and the answer to that question is in the prawns. So Kytazan comes from prawns? Yeah. Each haul is around two tonnes, and can take eight hours to sort. Oh my oh. So we ventured below deck to help Bjorn with the catch. Yeah, okay, 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 hurry, hurry. Yeah, oh, yeah. Catch. Oh. But you use so. lots of hair products, you're a model. I did not realise that they were using prawn in my hair. No. I am never using hair products. Oh, yeah. Is that <laughs> yes. You're saying that, there's under there, under there, under oh, there. Oh, got one, got one, got one. Oh, my God. You're absolutely sure about that? And this is going on my hair. With that delightful thought, we followed the prawns ashore where they're boiled, ready for processing. Four and a half million prawns are processed here every day. So what's going on here? Uh, this is a prawn peeling plant. Where does the kaizen come from? Which bit of the prawn? From the shells. It is from the shells? Yeah. So it is all ah. left over. While the meat makes its way to sandwiches in the UK, the tough shells that protect the prawns go next door to be processed. Oh, no. That is really disgusting. Each one of these trucks contains 13 tonnes of shells packed with a substance called chitin, which will later become chitazan. So I'm not putting that in my hair. Chances are you probably have, love. After we hose them down, the shells are mixed with hydrochloric acid to remove the calcium, and then mixed with sodium hydroxide, which is commonly known as caustic soda, to remove protein and colour. According to the manufacturers, removing protein lowers the risk of an allergic reaction to the shellfish. It doesn't look like a shell or a meat or... It smells of nothing. The white sludge is chitin, which is pressed and dried. It's not still uh, chitosan. Still no, no. From here it's processed further into a powder and that's it, chitosan. Simply add water, citric acid, ethanol, and you've got a basic hairspray. So what do the girls think? I don't have an issue because I eat the prawns, so that's, for me, is fine. The fact that the shell is used in this way, that it's this miracle product, I think it's fantastic. Vegetarian. Yes. Moral dilemma. What are you going to do now about your hair products? Personally, for ethical reasons, now I know that it has come from a creature, that I'm going to go home and check all of my products and anyone's that do contain the ingredients, I think will be checked out. I just couldn't use it, couldn't use it. I should be imagining the prawns on my hair otherwise. I was amazed to discover just how many hair products Kytazan is in. And when you look at a prawn shell, you can see why. It is just so tough and flexible. It's an amazing natural material. 
Once I got started, I found the beauty industry was bursting with animal byproducts. If Rachel was upset to discover prawns in her hairspray, I wonder what she would have made of pig in a hairbrush. Right, guys, really silly question. What's this? Brush. What are these? Bristles. Bristles? What are they made out of? You should know this. You work in a hair salon. Yeah. Where do you think bristles come from? Bristol. <laughs> it's the hair off an animal. Any idea which Horse. animal? A pig. Pig have hair? Pig have <laughs> hair. Well, you know when you read on the packet, it's real bristle? That's what it is. You didn't know that? Pig hair or bristle, to give it its technical term, has been used for brush making for hundreds of years. It's said to be the best possible material to run through your hair. Stiff yet supple and slightly scaly in texture, bristle removes dirt and debris and transfers the natural oils down the length of the hair to give a natural glossy sheen. The hair is removed from the pigs by submerging them in scalding water after they've been slaughtered. I mean, that's just strange, isn't it? <laughs> Most of the world's bristle actually comes from China, but I was keen to give our British bristle a go. You got some bags for me? Yeah, I've got one here. I don't know whether that's going to be big enough. Go on, squeeze go it on, in, I'll squeeze it, I'll push it in. I'll push it in, I don't mind touching it. <laughs> very nice. Bristle in hand, I headed off to make my very own hairbrush. This is rare breed boar bristle. It's not that much, is there? No, really? it's not that much. <laughs> this is what we need. So this is from China, this one? Yeah. Hiya, Jane. Hello. Hello, Jane. Ah, and there we go. And there you are. You see, that's not so bad. Well, maybe it is. It's not just hair brushes that contain bristle. It's traditionally found in shaving brushes, paint brushes, and believe it or not, some toothbrushes. To keeping clean, animal leftovers make their way into all our homes and sometimes entirely unrecognisable forms. I learned more about a hidden animal product that's everywhere when I visited the Lake District to witness a process called rendering. Over half a million tonnes of sheep, cow and pig parts go unwanted by the food industry every year. But they don't go to waste. They make their way to rendering sites across the UK. Though it's a vital job, it's a pretty grisly one and something that's historically been kept under wraps. Alba Proteins kindly gave me a rare opportunity to see rendering firsthand. Site manager Simon Boys agreed to show me around. Today we've got a load of sheep coming in to so we can process. Right. About how much? Is a big truck? Um, about 20 to 25 tonnes we normally receive in one load. The raw animal parts are unloaded into a huge bin. 25 tonnes of sheep, bits and bobs. Yeah. It's pretty gruesome. You've got to say, I mean, the blood on the floor, the fleshy bits. It is. But what you've got to appreciate is this is materials which are fit for humans, but they choose not to eat. Yeah. The sheep parts had just started to decay and were giving off a real stink. I haven't actually smelled anything quite as pungent. Even in an abattoir, it really sticks to the back of your throat. And if that lorry load of sheep parts didn't smell pretty, they certainly didn't look pretty either. Oh, that's a lot of sheep heads. It is. We've got sheep heads, hooves, inners, sheep fat, and also the carcass as well. From the bins, the sheep parts pass into the crusher, which has a large screw inside that pounds them into small pieces as it rotates. Uh, you see the picture there is the crusher. That's crushing the material down to a particle size, and we pump direct into the cooker. So basically, that's turning it into pate. <laughs> that's right, yes. The material then goes into the cooker. So here we have the material which is being cooked at the moment. We heat the material up to a minimum of 120 degrees. It kills the bacteria, flashes off the moisture. It's like a kebab machine. Yeah, you can naturally see the oil being released from the material. The solid material goes on to be made into fertiliser and dried pet food, while the melted animal fat is squeezed out by a press and drained off. This is what I'd come for, 
It's known in the industry as tallow. That's it, that's tallow. That's our finished product that we sell to the customer. It's like gravy. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of that in there. There certainly is, yes. And that's going off to all of your customers? It does, yes. So the million dollar question is, Simon, who are your customers? What is this used in these days? Conditioners, cosmetics, it forms the first ingredient of a cleaning agent. That's a bit of a surprise, I must say. Have you ever tasted any? I haven't, no. <laughs> Don't blame you. I wonder how many people know about this product. And how they feel about it when they know how it's made. All right, boys. To find out, I met up with Jenny and Laura, who knew very little about what went into their weekly wash. Thank you. Yeah. So you're students? Yeah. And what do you look for in your washing products? Well, the price. Price. Uh, what's on offer? Do you ever look at the ingredients? No. No. Anything, look at the ingredients on that. See, does anything stick out to you? Mm -hmm. Read that one. Okay. I don't even know what those words are. What's the worst thing it could be? I think if it was dead animal in there, then that would be the worst thing ever. OK, this is what is in a lot of fabric conditioners and soaps. <gasps> uh, oh, my oh, God. Oh, can't even look at it! That is disgusting. How what even is that? That is sheep's head. Oh. oh! It's not just sheep. There are lots of animals that go into this kind of product. So it's in everything? It's in an awful lot. It's in lots of fabric conditioners. It's in lots of soaps. I don't feel clean. No. <laughs> oh, I don't. I feel like... Oh, I keep looking at its little face. It's like you're cleaning yourself with fat. <laughs> it doesn't really work out, does it? I don't mind it, to be honest. Yeah, no, I think it's quite disgusting, actually, because you're actually wiping out all over your body. <laughs> so... Gets you clean, though. <laughs> That's gross. Are you curious to know how something like that yeah. becomes yeah. this product? Yeah. yeah. Well, we've got an expert and he's going to answer any questions. Right. Yeah. We were joined by David Howells, a chemist with 30 years' experience in the tallow trade. What's your big question? Why? I just don't get it. Why, why is that how used? How is that head used to in make In that this? bottle? That's a liquid be and that's a Because it head. was there. You've had your sheep, you've eaten it. As a byproduct from that, you're left with this fat and you find things to do with it. Come on, girls, let me just show you. I've got a little demonstration here. If we put some of the tallow in here, this is just some simple caustic soda solution, and instantly it's reacted. When you add salt to it, the soap comes to the surface, run off the water, and you make it into a bar of soap. That's it. Tallow and tallow-derived chemicals have a number of different names. Just some of those to look out for on your labels include sodium tallowate, tallow alcohol, tallow amine, or they might be listed as cationic surfactants. When we see tallow on a label, does it always come from an animal? It's always animal fat. And when it's a surfactant, is that always from an animal as well? No, it oh. can be from tallow, but it can also be totally synthetic, a detergent made from chemicals. How do you know? Unless it actually specifies what surfactants there are, you don't. You have to go right into the chemistry of it. It's clear that getting to the bottom of what's in our products can be tricky. But once we know about hidden ingredients like tallow, we then have to decide how we feel about them. Has it changed the way you think about what you buy? Has it changed your perception of the industry? Yeah. Definitely. It's really deceiving. Yeah. How... I mean, I'm sorry, I'm like a quick in and out, so I'll just grab what I need and go. And I would never think to look at it, but yeah. now I would definitely take a minute to look and see what's in it. And we know the words now, so yeah. we know what's no, in it. Yeah, no, to look out for. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think the fact that animals have been used in these products should be labelled? Should yeah, be Yeah, I think it should, yeah. because they still put on animal testing and you know, super for vegetarians, vegans, all sorts. I think they should yeah. at least indicate it because if people still want to use it, then they will. Like, we know now, but we'll still mm. buy it. Yeah. Whereas, if nobody knows, then they're using it unaware. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's a bit rubbish. Do you want to take the sheep heads with you? No. Um, I think we'll Think they can there. stay there. Discovering that animal fats can help to keep us clean was just one of the surprises I encountered. From products that improve our bodies to products that claim to improve our minds, I never thought I'd find a bit of an animal nestled in the pages of my bedtime read. I was curious to find out what animal byproduct might be in these prolific page turners. So I recruited avid readers Andy and Emily to help me find out. 
I've got a student cookbook. It's something my mum gave me before I went to uni. It's like, you may need this to survive. <laughs> Where's the midnight snack section? <laughs> <laughs> my nan sent me a cookbook for singles. I was like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Rub it in. Yeah. I prefer hardback because my paperbacks usually get completely ruined. I'd buy a hardback when it's just come out and it's really exciting. I mean, it's like first edition or something like that. It's quite, it makes it special. Like, There's something more to it. Like, yeah. it seems it like seems a bit... more of an upgrade. Yeah, like, exactly. More, a bit more of a like you spent version. a little bit more money yeah. on it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, yeah. Although these two are never far from a book, they know very little about how they're made, so we headed off to Diamond Print Services, one of the UK's leading bookbinders, to find out. So welcome to Sunny Enfield. Yeah. Both students. Yep. When you're reading, yeah. do you ever think about how your books are put together, how they're made, where they come from? It's no. just not something you really consider. It never crosses your mind. It's just, it's just one of those yeah, things, really. Yeah, you just get it, it from the shop and it's in there. In the shop, it's there. Do you think any animals are used in the manufacturing of books? I wouldn't have thought I wouldn't, that at all. No, no, I wouldn't have connected that with books at all. No. And they're not the only ones. <laughs> which, which bit? It's obviously not the paper. I don't know, potentially the glossy pages. Some sort of fish. Something to do with the binding, I would assume. Maybe the letters, like the print. The ink from Altus. Back in Enfield, bookbinding specialist Nick Dingwall promised to reveal all. <laughs> so here we have the ingredient that goes into producing books. All books? Pretty much, all hardback books, yes. Come on, Nick. There oh. we are. <laughs> OK. <Like> this. <laughs> they are yeah. bones. Well, yeah. they're a bit nippy as well. The yeah. glue that we use to bind the books is derived from hide and bones, oh. yeah. primarily from cattle. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Animal glue isn't something we make in this country anymore, but in countries like Egypt, they continue to make glue as they have done for thousands of years. In Cairo, cattle bones are collected from abattoirs across the city and brought by the truckload to the Lion Glue Factory, where they're heaped into giant piles. The first task in making glue is to sort the bones from the horns and the hooves and remove any rubbish that might have made it into the mix. The sorted bones are then placed onto a conveyor belt, which takes them to a crusher where they're broken down into smaller, more manageable pieces. Next, the fat has to be stripped from the bones using a strong solvent. This process is called degreasing. The degreased bones are now ready for the final step in the glue making process. They're heated in the degluing machine. The intense heat and pressure melts the collagen inside the bones and it runs out as a hot, sticky glue. The fresh glue is collected in bottles, ready for use. So that's the glue? Yep, that's yeah. actually a block that's of fine. animal derived glue. Looks like toffee. And what does the packaging say on that? The manufacturers of adhesives now are a little bit squeamish about calling it animal glue. Right. So they tend to prefer to call it things like protein glue or jelly glue, because essentially, jelly is yeah. exactly what that is. Animal glue is used to stick the face paper on hardback covers, the decorative head and tail band you get on fancy books, and any ribbons. So it's quite a big ingredient for you. It's a fairly major ingredient, but it's a very natural ingredient and it's a byproduct of a lot of other processes. So it's the ultimate in recycling, really. Nick got the guys making book covers to get a feel for the glue. That is the raw material. Okay. <laughs> the out of covering material, a front board, back board, and a spine. Go. The solid blocks of animal glue are melted to a runny liquid, which spreads easily but dries fast. And the key to this is to work reasonably quickly. Oh, you can see it drying already. The animal glue is extremely tacky, which makes it perfect for sticking paper to card. You can smell it more now that it's melted. Definitely. It's really smelly now. It's sticking my hands together. It's, it's really, really sticky. sticky. On your hands. Yeah, that's looking good. Well, depending on your definition. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to finish first. It's I think my definition today I think is generous. I'm <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily be putting it round a book that we're going to make, but. 
Yes. It's all right. OK, time to see how the machines do it. To give you an idea of exactly how much of an adhesive should be on there, that very thin film on this rotating drum is actually the amount of adhesive. Very fine layer. Very, very thin layer. At one end of the casing machine, the cardboard's fed in and cut into three pieces. At the other end, the face paper is fed in and over the drum, which applies a thin layer of animal glue. The board and the paper are then pressed together and the edges folded up. Slightly neater job happening yeah. there, isn't it? And there we are, a stack of finished cases. Is it not better? Yeah, that's much nicer. The vast majority of hardback books use animal glue in their binding. But we were curious to learn why when there are other glues available. There are synthetic glues out there, there aren't there? Are... So, so why is it so widely used? The synthetics that are available are derived mainly from the chemical and oil industry. They're things that are going to run out at some point. And this is still a completely organic, completely recycled material. Does it make it cheaper? Absolutely. Oil prices, chemical prices are increasing, but as a natural recycled product, this is something that you know, we, can, we can continue to use and it's reasonably cost-effective. Our tour was over, but before we left, Nick had a present for me. We've got something for you just about to be delivered out now. Yeah? Yeah. OK. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, my <laughs> lifetime's work. <laughs> it was just a gag, of course, but what did other people make of books stuck with animal glue? It's quite a shock, to be honest. It's something you wouldn't really think that happens. I don't know, I think it's really disgusting. I don't, I don't know, I, I don't quite like the idea of that, to be honest. I think it's all right if it's like a byproduct of meat. It doesn't bother me, I eat the meat, so why would I not use the glue? I wouldn't associate a cow with a book, but it's resourceful. Is this going to change anything for you? Um, Not personally, for me. no. I, I'm still going to read books. Yeah. Um, I'll probably think about it. When I, uh, when I open a book and I'll yeah. probably tell my friends, <laughs> but I'm not a vegan or, or anything like that. So. It won't make an impact on my life. And also, like, especially with some books, you can only get them in hardback. And what you're supposed yeah. to do, like, you know, if you really want it. So next time you're sitting on the sofa, nose in the book. Yeah. Are you going to be as enthralled with the storyline or might you be like having a little look at the cover and stuff now? I'm not sure I'm going to have my nose quite so deep in the book <laughs> this time. <laughs> Animal glue isn't just used for the binding of books. It's also used in the manufacture of some trainers, board games, puzzles and playing cards. Chances are you're handling part of a cow every single day. Work or play, animal byproducts are never far away. I found our leisure pursuits littered with animal parts. Which part of a tennis racket do you think might be made from an animal? The strings. I'd say the strings are a handle. The strings? Maybe it's in the strings. Yeah, I think it's the strings. Made of skin. Like cat liver or something really weird? Why maybe like whiskers wrapped around? The gut. This is what we want to guess. The strings on some tennis rackets are indeed made from the intestines of cows. Yeah. Hey, have a go, look. Oh, yeah, there you go. What's that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's just it's just pasta. It's, it's fine. How many of these would go into a tennis racket? Fifteen strands. Fifteen strands. So five is one cow. So, yeah. you, so how many cows? Three cows. Three <laughs> cows. The soggy intestines are cut into long ribbons of gut, which are washed, wound together tightly, and then dried. These strings have been here for one week. A week? Yeah, they have to be dried very slowly. Once they're varnished, they're ready to use. These strong elastic gut strings are favoured over synthetic strings by many of the world's pros. Sheep's guts, meanwhile, are used for an altogether more amorous activity. Do we know what these are? Yeah, I know what that means. Yeah, do you know what that is? <laughs> what do you think that's made out of? Latex. What, what is that, plastic or...? I'm not sure. What is that? It's intestines. It is indeed. All right. <laughs> nice. How do you feel about that now? A bit weird. It's not the way they used to make them out of in the yeah. old days. I tell you what, gents, take one. Oh, thank you. Ever so cool. kind. Give it, let me know how tonight. you get on. <laughs> well, what time do you finish? <laughs> <laughs>
Though these old-fashioned condoms may help to prevent pregnancy, they don't protect from STDs. So for the safest sex, it's best to stick with the more modern variety. Even when it comes to pleasure seeking, it seems that animal byproducts are involved. I met up with some rugby boys from Canterbury to find out which animal organ is involved in their favourite pastime. Come to uni and you want to join the rugby team. I think people just expect you will be drinking. Yeah! My drinking team has a rugby problem. Yeah. <laughs> On a away match, we'd start drinking as soon as we finished the game in the change rooms. Hopefully we had a win and we're all in good spirits to start drinking there. There isn't much I wouldn't drink. We drank urine out of a pint. Dog food. Sick. Yeah. Would an early start at Billingsgate Fish Market be enough to put them off their booze? Temi, morning lads, hi, hi. morning, how are we doing? Yeah, that's Fantastic. Good. It's early. It is early. <laughs> what do you think we're doing at this ungodly hour at Billingsgate Market? At a fish market, something to do with beer, not a clue. There's a product in beer called Isinglass, or Isinglass, apparently. From Come a across. fish? Or? Yeah, from a yeah, fish. Cool. From a fish, all right, cool. What do you think of the fact that there's something fishy in your beer? Does that put you off beer? Yeah, um, a little bit. Not yet. Than... Not yet. Not you yet. don't know what no. it is? Yeah. No, um, Should you find out how gruesome wanna, it is? Yeah, I want to find out, yeah. Okay, come on. So, yeah. <laughs> I think it'll be all right. Maybe CJ Jackson, the director of Billingsgate Seafood Training School, would enlighten us. CJ, we know that there's something called Isinglass in beer, but what is it? Uh, it actually is a dried swim bladder of a fish. What's a swim bladder? A swim bladder is like the buoyancy aid. It basically keeps round fish upright. And in the 18th century, they used to take the swim bladder from a beluga sturgeon. Today, uh, beluga sturgeons are really endangered. So what they're using now is a fish called uh, Vietnamese catfish or pangasius. What CJ hadn't told us is that Pangasius can grow up to three metres long. As it's hard to find whole ones in the UK, we were going to see the same principle on a much smaller scale. Say hello to Gary the Gurnard. I'm going to hold on to the tail. I'm going to insert the scissors into the back of the head of the fish. OK. And then just gently push. Not liking that. No, not at all. <laughs> that wasn't nice. Well, Come on, well. Teddy, mate. It's not that bad. Just man up. Bend the fish down. Oh, I don't want it to splat it's on me. It's not going to splat. Absolutely fine. Put my finger in there and just gently ease back. And this time the swim bladder has got is full of gas, so it's intact. So you can see the um, swim bladder. Bend it right under. Oh look, there we go. Out. I've got. Can you see the look swim the bladder? bladder? I see. Yeah, you've got and... one as well. Yeah, there's one as well. Excellent. Just so that's the bit that you're going to use. What I still don't quite understand is how it's used in beer. Well, I know they dry it. Uh, but when it actually comes to the actual function and how they actually use it, you need to speak to a brewer. Beer historian Peter Hayden agreed to show us around his specialist brewery in Greenwich, South London. Let's go. Huh? Contain yourselves, we're going into a brewery. <laughs> This is um, a fish moor. Which is a swim bladder. Effectively, yeah. Which is the raw material from oh, yeah. which we make Isinglass. It's a protein called collagen. It's the same thing as some ladies like to put in their lips to make them bigger. So... Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's a very pure and natural form of protein. So how does that end up with an Isinglass? Um, there are a couple of manufacturers in the UK who produce this for the brewing industry. They will take the raw material, process it firstly um, into a powder, mm or in the format that we're going to use it as a much more liquid format. Can we see this in action now, how it actually works? Yeah, by all means. Isinglass is used in the production of many cask ales, some stouts and a few lagers. Yeast cells in beer make it cloudy. Normally, it would take four days for these cells to sink to the bottom of a keg, leaving a clear beer. Adding Isinglass speeds up this process as it attracts the yeast cells into heavy clusters, which sink to the bottom in just six hours. So, Kev, if you want to do the honours. Let's have a look at 
David. Da, da, da. Wow. That's ridiculous. So the swim bladder is at the bottom of that keg? Absolutely at the bottom. So if Isinglass falls to the bottom of the barrel, does Peter think there's any of it left in the final drink? It's not. You insist it's not a part of the beer. It's not a part of no. the mix. No longer. Studies agree that in the majority of cases, Isinglass is undetectable in the finished pint. But some bottle-conditioned ales and cask ales, if served from too near the bottom of the barrel, may still contain minute amounts. Guys, I found the whole process today really interesting and fascinating, but it hasn't put me off at all. What about you? When you were cutting open the fish and stuff and you saw it there and all the blood and guts and stuff, it's a bit, you know, but when you see it all dried out and then the liquid, it doesn't put me off at all. I know it was a bit squeamish to start off with. But to be honest, it is part of my life anyway. It's part of my lifestyle, so I'm not going to give it up that easy. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Good Cheers. day. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Who would have thought a fish bladder could brighten up your beer? In the surprising stakes, Isinglass was right up there, but it wasn't perhaps the most noble use for an animal byproduct. A trip to Southampton Airport revealed a protein from cow hooves is used to make special aviation firefighting foam. A protein is extracted, uh, which is turned into a concentrate, which we mix with water and air, which produces the foam. Have a sniff. Oh! Meanwhile, in a hair-raising textile experiment, we put sheep's wool to the test. Set a light alongside polyester, wool proved itself nature's finest fire blanket. Well, less toxic smoke, no dripping, no dripping at all, and actually it's self-extinguished, so it's not actually having to put out a fire here. Are you surprised, Dan? Yeah, I thought it would be like literally a wall with flames. It turned out that some animals and their byproducts had life-saving properties. None more so than the pig. <laughs> I was intrigued to discover ballistics experts use blocks of gelatin made from pig skin as a substitute for human flesh. That is so strange. Analyzing the impact of bullets helps them design better protective clothing and medical care for our troops. Because pigs are so similar to humans in their anatomy, they've proved extremely useful in the field of medicine. I met 19-year-old Glaswegian Robin, who might not be here today were it not for the pig. Last year, I was diagnosed with a heart condition called aortic stenosis. It came totally out of the blue because I've been working out since I was like 14. And I was doing a fitness test at college. It was the mile run and I couldn't stop coughing after it. I went to the doctor. I was sent off for ECGs and heart scans. I had this rare heart condition and I needed heart surgery. The main valve taking blood from Robin's heart to her body was critically narrow. It would have to be replaced. I was told that if I carried on doing my fitness, I could have been a goner in like a year's time. Came out of the surgeon's office just totally devastated. I had to take my own aortic valve and replace it with a pig's one. I chose a pig's one because it's the most similar to a human valve. I mean, I was shocked to know that you could do stuff like that. Like, you know, they could take bits from animals and, and put them inside a human. How are you feeling? A little bit nervous. <laughs> To find out more about the piggy part Robin has inside her, I took her to meet Dr Dan Tucker at Cambridge University Veterinary School. Hi, yeah. Robin. Lovely to meet you, too. Nice to meet you, yeah. too. Yeah. So you're in charge of our dissection today. I am. I am. So and what we need to do before we go through into the post-mortem room is just to put some protective clothing on. Dan and his team routinely conduct post-mortems on animals who've died of unknown causes. The pig on the table unfortunately had to be put down because of a painful lameness problem, which Dan had been asked to investigate. In terms of their anatomy, pigs are very close to humans, aren't they, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. Blood pressures in the pig are actually remarkably similar to people because, after all, we live actually similar lifestyles, mainly sedentary. We forage around for food and then we go to sleep. And so the whole metabolism is the same. Dissecting the pig gave us the rare opportunity to see the heart in detail. 
So these are the lungs here, this is the heart. It was an emotional moment for Robin as the organ was cut out. This is the aorta coming up. You can see it's a very thick-walled, elastic structure. And, and down in the gloom of there, you can actually see the aortic valve. This is the bit that was transplanted over to you. That <laughs> is incredible. Do you want to hold it? No, thanks. No? Cutting it open revealed the three tiny leaflets that make up the valve and keep the blood pumping round our bodies. So do you, you can see, see them very Do you see now these, yeah. these little cusps? They're like little half moons. They're little pockets. Very, very tough, fibrous tissue. They look very delicate. They do. They look like little petals. If it wasn't for these, as, as, as you know, you can't cope. Mm -hmm. It's funny, something that small saved me. That's, That's keeping you alive. Yeah. That's why you're standing here yeah. now. Robin's heart valve replacement operation was pioneered over 30 years ago. At King's College Hospital London, top cardiothoracic surgeon Olaf Wendler performs the skilled procedure every week. To gain access to the heart and the aortic valve, you need to open the chest. This is done by sawing through and splitting the breastbone. A piece of heart membrane is carefully cut away to be used later in the operation. The patient is then attached to a heart and lung bypass machine, which will take over circulation during surgery. OK, start to go on bypass. A solution is used next to chemically stop the heart, while the aorta, the largest artery in the body, is cut open. The damaged aortic valve is then carefully cut away and the pre-packed pig valve prepared. The new heart valve is delicately inserted into position and carefully stitched into place using the membrane cut away earlier. The aorta is reconnected and as blood is reintroduced into the heart, it begins to beat again. We have normal blood supply of the heart again. The heart-lung machine is still pumping. The blood now goes also into the heart itself again. Starts again purely due to the fact that normal blood supply is re-established to the heart and enables the heart cells to produce a heart rhythm again. The pig valve is working and the chest is neatly closed. Because you're a vegetarian, did you ever question whether or not you would accept part of an animal? I didn't, I didn't question it at all. It, it was a matter of light, life and death. I don't think anybody would think twice about it. Mm. I'm just happy to be standing here. Absolutely, Thanks. we're happy as well. <laughs> Thanks, little piggies. <laughs> The life-saving ability of the pig heart valve surely makes it the most important animal product I've encountered. And it's just one more example of the ingenious ways I've seen leftover animal parts transformed into something useful. What's amazed me is not just the huge number of animal products all around us, but the fact that the bits of animals we don't eat have so many valuable natural qualities that we can exploit. And given that we farm these animals, to me it seems sensible and almost a moral duty that the bits don't go to waste.